BoardGameBrawl.com. Hey now, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and today we're going to be taking a look at a game that is currently seeking funding on Kickstarter. That game is called Stealing Mona Lisa, and it's from the company No Chance Games. Now, if you like what you see throughout the rest of this preview video, I'm going to encourage you to go to the official Kickstarter project page. I'll have a link to the screen now and at the end of the video, and also down in the description section of the video. That'll take you to the page. You can find out more information than I could possibly tell you here, and hopefully you'll consider backing the project. Now, what is Stealing Mona Lisa? This is a competitive game for up to seven players. You and the other players are uh, thieves who are trying to steal famous works of art from different museums. You all have this set of uh, thief like skills, thievely skills, I don't know what that word would be, and you are trying to use them to your best advantage to steal these works of art, but you are all vying for the same works of art. So which one in particular do you go after, hoping that the other players don't want that one, or do you all go for the same and hope that you can overpower them and get to it first with your superior skills? Now, mechanically speaking, in the game, this is a drafting game. You're drafting on uh, different skill cards to have the best skills in your hand, and then hoping to choose the right card for you, that's uh, the right art card for you, it's gonna let you take it and edge out your opponents. Let me go ahead and give you a brief overview of how the game plays with a prototype version of the game. So what you see here may be different in the final version. Then we're gonna come back and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, I am going to give you a brief overview of Stealing Mona Lisa. This is a competitive game for up to seven players. The goal of the game is to acquire these rare painting cards, uh, three examples of which you see right here. They have a monetary value associated with them. At the end of the game, whoever has stolen a, a, the most artwork that is, or I'm sorry, I should say the most valuable artwork, the art pieces that add up to the greatest sum of money is going to be the winner of the game. There are tiebreakers. If one player has Mona Lisa, they're going to win. If uh, one of the if that's not the case, and the player who has the highest single value on one of their pieces of art is the winner, and then if there's a tie, you just play again and figure out who is going to be the real winner. And the game will end, and you'll do the scoring when there are not enough pieces of artwork left to have at least two pieces of artwork on in the center of the table. So if you ever get to uh, a new round of play and there is going to be new artwork that needs to be replenished, if you can't put at least two out there, you stop, the game is over, add up all of your artwork. Now, as far as the beginning setup of the game, uh, while we're on the subject of the art deck, these are the red-backed cards. You're going to shuffle those up, and you're going to put out a number of pieces of artwork equal to the number of players minus one. So I have a four-player game set up here, so I have three of them set out in the center of the table. At the end of each round, you're going to refill back up to three. If by chance there are not, uh, there are there is artwork that is left over from the previous round that will stay out there and not get flushed away. You'll just refill up to three. In this particular example, where I happen to have a four-player game, now all of the other all of the players in the game are going to get five cards from the skill deck. Those are the blue-backed uh, cards. So you'll start off with five cards randomly from that deck, which I'll get to in a moment. And you also are going to start off with a, a set of what are called choice cards. These uh, have a color on the back and front, and they're also going to have letters on the front. You're always going to keep these uh, secret to yourself because the other players are not supposed to know which choice card you're selecting each round. These go from A to F, although uh, what you're going to do with one of the unused colors that's not in your game, so there's eight, the game goes up to seven and there are eight colors of cards, so you'll always have at least one color left over. You take one of those unused colors and put letters uh, underneath each of the uh, paintings that's in the row. So obviously with more players you're going to have more letters to use out here, and so uh, those are going to correspond to the cards, to the uh, pieces of artwork that the players are choosing with their choice cards. So you may not actually end up using all the letters that you have in your player choice deck. Now let's take a look at a few uh, more of the artwork cards and I just want to break down what exactly is on the card. So you have the famous work of art up on the top, then you have the value of the artwork for the end game scoring. Whoever has the most total value of artwork is going to be the winner. And then underneath it, there are skill icons. All of the different pieces of artwork have a different combination of skill icons, sometimes two, sometimes three. In order to successfully steal these pieces of artwork, you're going to need to play skill cards 
with those particular icons. I'll explain more about that in a moment, but since we're on the topic of the skill cards, those are the blue backed cards. Uh, you're gonna get a random hand of these at the start of the game, and you're gonna gain new ones every round. These all have different pictures representing different thief skills, like uh, uh, getaway skills, and uh, schematics, and strength, and hacking, and so on and so forth. So you'll have these different types of cards with numbers from one to seven. You'll be shuff they'll be shuffled up and dealt out to you. Now, the first thing that the players are going to do at the start of each round is draft the skill cards that they have. If you're not familiar with drafting, how you're going to do this is you're going to secretly look at your hand of five cards. You're going to choose one of those skill cards that you like, and you're going to put it face down in front of you. Then the remaining four cards that you have, you are going to pass to your left to the next player in line while they're doing the exact same thing, and the third player is doing the exact same thing, and the fourth player is doing the exact same thing. So everyone takes a card and passes the remaining four cards to the next player. Then you do it again and again and again and again until you have a brand new hand of five cards down on the table in front of you. That is going to be the hand that you're going to use for the round. Now it is important to note here that in every round after the first round, it is entirely possible that you're going to have cards that carried over from one round to the next, skill cards that is. If that's the case, you do not add those to your hand as soon as you get your new hand of five cards for the round. You keep those off to the side, then when you're finished drafting with the, uh, the current five skill cards, you'll be able to add those carried over cards to your hand. So you'll have uh, more cards potentially than the other players to work with. Once every player has their brand new hand of skill cards, they are going to look out at the famous works of art that are available to steal from various museums, and you are going to choose which one you are going to focus on to try and steal. Then you're going to put however many skill cards you want from your hand face down in front of you, hopefully corresponding to the correct skill symbols you need in order to steal that work of art. So if I wanted to steal this portrait of the little girl in the dress, I would need to have a getaway skill and the, uh, the wall climbing skill. And so I need to have at least those two skills in my pile of cards. And once I remember you're doing this all in secret, you're just sort of eyeing the cards and hoping that the other players don't figure out which one you're going for. Once I've chosen the painting I want to go for, and once I've chosen the skills I'm going to need in order to go for that painting, then I'm going to take one of my choice cards and actually lock that in. So if I wanted to go for B, I would secretly choose the B card and put that face down on top of my stack of skill cards until all the other players have done the same thing. Now, once every player has locked in their decision, then the players are going to simultaneously reveal their choice cards. So let's just say, for example, that these two players had uh, locked in their choices, and then this player, the purple player, decided to go with A, and I decided to go with B, and maybe the other players, one at least one player, since there's only three paintings, is gonna have to go for something different. So we'll say that these two players decided to go for C. So when they flip over their choice cards that they previously selected, uh, they are gonna be going for the same painting, whereas the two of us are going for something different. Now, if only one person is going for a particular painting, that player automatically gets to take the painting. They're gonna take it, they're gonna put it face down in front of them, no problems whatsoever. Actually, in this particular example, I took the B. So there you go. I would get that B painting. I put that face down, that's gonna to count to my final score. No one can take that away from me. And in fact, the skill cards that I use to take it, I just put these face down in the discard pile and nobody gets to know what I used to take that painting. Maybe I had the right skills, maybe I didn't, but they will never know. So that's an interesting uh, bluffing aspect in the game. So just to continue with our example, uh, the purple player is gonna go ahead and take A automatically and also discard their cards. And then the other two players, however, are going for the same painting, C. So how is that gonna work? Well, in this case, players are gonna have to, these two players who are vying for it are going to have to uh, battle each other with their thievery skills. So they're gonna have to flip over all their skill cards. And remember, this is just an example. I didn't preset these up, so it's probably not gonna be the right skills. But uh, they're gonna flip over all their skill cards and first see if they have the right skills for the job. If at least, uh, if the cards that they have have at least those two symbols on there somewhere, then they are going to be eligible to steal that painting. If either of the players or any of the players who are involved in uh, trying to steal that painting do not have all the required symbols at least once for each symbol, they do not get uh, to take part 
in the thievery. They can take their cards uh, back into hand. They can put them off to the side and be able to potentially reuse them later, but they are done and they will not get, be able to steal. But if everyone who is, or at least multiple people who are involved in trying to steal that painting do have the required skills, then you have to figure out who the better thief is. You add up all of the total values from the cards, from only the skill cards that are applicable to stealing that particular painting. Anything with a different symbol cannot be used. Otherwise, you add up all the values of all the cards that are involved in stealing, and whoever has the higher value is going to be the winner, and they're going to get to take that artwork. If there is a tie, you're going to look at the art and look at the uh, symbol that is farthest to the left on the card. And whoever has the most value of that symbol is going to break the tie in their favor. Now, any thief that did not claim artwork is going to put their unused skill cards off to the side with the other cards that they did not contribute to their hand of skill cards for, uh, for the purposes of stealing. So, uh, and how you do that is actually any extra cards that you have are going to go under your unused choice cards as well to sort of keep them separate. Now, if it is the case that you have extra cards over underneath your unused choice cards, now you potentially have the opportunity to save some of those cards for the next round, which is something I alluded to earlier. The number of cards that you get to keep over from round to round in this particular situation is different depending on the number of players. So for instance, in a seven player game, you can only keep one card between rounds, but in a three, four or five player game, you can keep three cards in a six player game, you can keep two. So definitely something to keep in mind. Regardless of what happens there, you're gonna start a new round. And when you start a new round, your, each player is going to get a brand new hand of five skill cards face down from the skill card decks. Remember that they have to keep that separate from any cards that they carry over, at least at first, until you've done the draft. And then you're going to replace the artwork out in the center up to the required amount based on the number of players. So for instance, three in a four player game, all players will take back their choice skill cards and prep them for the new round. You'll put the uh, game skill cards back, or choice cards back underneath their paintings and then you'll do it all over again. Drafting, choosing the paintings you want to go for to try to steal, and then potentially battling the other players in order to get them. Once enough artwork has been used from the main pile that you can only refill one or zero cards in the lineup when a new round starts, then it is time to end the game. Whoever has the most total value of artwork in their face down pile of artwork is going to be the winner of the game with ties being broken as I mentioned before depending on the rarity of the artwork that you have in your own personal collection. One more thing I'll mention is that there is a variant in the game called pointing where instead of using the choice cards to select the paintings you want to go for uh, instead you won't use them at all and you will just do pointing so first everyone will simultaneously point at the piece of artwork that they want then after everyone gets a chance to look at what everyone is supposedly going for everyone will count down and on the count of like three or whatever you'll do it again and see if anyone used that information from the first time uh, to try and second guess you and so on. But that will be how you determine which paintings you go for, which is an interesting variant on the basic game rules. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. First and foremost, Stealing Mona Lisa has a fun theme that any casual gamers are going to find very accessible and easy to get into and that a lot of people are enjoying right now. It's one of those hot themes and that's being a thief, being like a thief who's a professional and uh, is vying for power amongst all the other thieves. And in this case, you're an art thief, which is even more of sort of a, a cool thing that a lot of movies and books have been based on. And when you take though that element there, that theme that everyone can kind of hopefully not relate to, but at least uh, find interesting. When you take that theme and then put it together with mechanisms, which themselves are popular gamerly gamer trendy uh, mechanisms like card drafting, uh, which is done, uh, which it makes sense for this type of game where you're all like sort of these kind of, you know, you share your knowledge a little bit, but ultimately you're all out for each other. So you try to make your own uh, personal repertoire of skills to use for these different heists and then hope that it all works out for you. But of course you are vying against all these other players. And so that's an interesting element of the game as well, because you uh, can just say, well, I don't want to go for the highest value artwork out there because everyone's going to be wanting to go for that. But maybe they don't have the skills that I have. I'm lucky. I have the two or three skills that's needed for that. So maybe I should go for it anyways. Or maybe I should go for one that's lower. 
but maybe they're all going to have that same thought too. So there's like an interesting like double bluff type thing here, trying to figure out what they're going to think that you're doing and then responding in kind. And sometimes you can just overwhelm the other person anyways, if you have the right draw of cards and sometimes you don't. And the whole element of how you can, if you go for a card that no one else wanted, you don't even have to show your cards. You just say, yeah, okay, I'll take it. So if nothing else, if even if your skills are really bad for the round, you can just take a chance and hopefully you'll get something. That's an interesting sort of catch up mechanism to where even if you uh, wouldn't necessarily have a good draw, you wouldn't have a good draft for the round, you might still get something anyways. Uh, and it is an easy game to learn. It's an easy game to get into. I said that the theme helps that, but also you'll, you'll know the rules in five minutes and you'll have it up and running. Games play quickly. And it's definitely a thing that a lot of casual gamers, but also gamerly gamers who are uh, familiar with these type of mechanisms can easily get into. So if you're one of the people that falls into those camps, I would definitely encourage you to go to the official Kickstarter project page. I'm gonna have a link at the bottom of your screen now and then also down in the description section of the video. That will take you to the page. You don't have to take my word for it. You can find out more information there and hopefully consider backing Stealing Mona Lisa from No Chance Games. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.